Kicking off our list at number 10, rat poison. Yeah, this one's pretty uh, pretty gross right off the hop. During the 16th century, it was common to fill your house with arsenic trioxide to keep rats from your food supply, right? You don't want those guys hanging around. They're bringing the plague in, a little nasty. Barbara Gilbert of Leicestershire, she thought that she was grabbing flour and ended up mixing this stuff with milk. That was a really bad mistake. She thought she was preparing a meal for her family when really she was about to poison them. Now, it's horrible to say, but Barbara, she took a sip, thankfully, before for her family, and then she was thankfully the only person who lost their life because of this, you know, poison that they made. It's tragic, but it could have been much, much worse. Everyone dying because of a rat poison plague? That's pretty horrible. But it happened again in 1599 when Margaret Moreland thought she was giving her husband ale. Really, it was arsenic trioxide and water, aka not ale. God, that would really suck. What a horrible mishap. Number nine, famine. Back in medieval times, food supplies solely relied on good weather and proper harvests. And obviously, lack of rats definitely helps. If the seasons were dry, people, of course, starved. More often than not, common folk would survive on rations of berries, corn, and wheat. Now, the lack of food, of course, led to disease. Now, if they didn't starve to death, illnesses like tuberculosis, smallpox, typhoid, influenza, and mumps often did the trick. The Great Famine of the early 14th century was historically awful. Between 1315 and 1322, it rained for 150 days at a time. That's, uh, that's a lot of water. Western Europe was a mess. These conditions took the lives of 15% of England. Farmers couldn't plant or harvest crops, and the winters during these years were historically bad as well. Insane rainfalls and severe freezing. We're still struggling to adapt to weather changes today, but imagine the dark ages. Weather sucked every day. It was horrible. Number eight. Weather witch. Aside from that little ice age I just referenced, what was the weather like for most of these medieval travelers? Five seasons of Game of Thrones. They talked about winter coming, but what were those winters really like? People in the 1400s believed that bad weather could be caused by the behavior of wicked people, like killers, those who sin, incest, that was a pretty bad one. Game of Thrones would have been screwed off the hop. That would have been a lot of horrible weather. Even family arguments were to blame. You talk back to your mom, next thing you know, the crops are frozen. Nice, way to go, Eric. It's on you. Now this eventually linked back to blaming witches or sorcerers who some believe could control the crops and or weather. Yeah, sorcerers controlling your crops, imagine that. The Malleus Maleficarum, published in 1486, this book straight up references a witch that would fly in the air and create storms. Yeah, with effects that took lives of animals and farmers. No thanks, I'm glad we don't have any of those floating about. We just have drones now, which are just as annoying. Number seven, Jesus take the wheel. With witches to blame for hailstorms, who do we turn to to fight the powers of evil, right? How do we get some goddamn crops back in the game? From the 14th to the 16th century, the ice pack grew around the world. Weather was changing in a drastic way, and by 1550, there had been an expansion of glaciers worldwide. Everyone thought that it was witches causing it. It's like, no, just plain old science. Back then, the general public didn't know what was happening. They didn't have Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining the phenomenon on a podcast. So people in the medieval times would perform rituals for harvesting crops in hopes that something would change. There would be special prayers, charms, beautiful services, all to ensure proper weather and fertility of the fields. Certain saints, like historical saints, they were believed to protect against harsh conditions. To protect us from the frost, we had Saint Surveys, and to shield us from the winds, we had Saint Clement. And to fight back against drought and the rains, we had the one and only Saint Elijah, or Elijah. The power of the saints and the Virgin Mary were believed to protect against storms and lightning. So that's like the medieval version of the Avengers, I guess. Tis the season. Thank you, Saint Mary. Let's keep it dry. Canada has a huge storm coming tonight, so could use some of that saint power ASAP. Number six, violence. Imagine going outside in medieval times. Is it dangerous? Is it lonely? Is it full of criminals? What's it like? What were those odds like just to get home? Street violence and brawls and taverns were as common as they are today. And like we saw a few times in Game of Thrones, peasants got a bit fed up from time to time. Yeah, I can't imagine why, huh? Vassals would revolt against their lords. This happened historically a few times. The rebellion of peasants in Flanders, this went down in 1323, and then 60 years Years later, England saw the peasants revolt in 1381. A lot of peasants getting fed up. Yeah, I, I would assume. I'm surprised it took that long, really. Number five, pole vaulting. The day pole vaulting was born was December 25th, 1521. It was a Christmas miracle, some would say. A laborer named Robert Baker, he was heading home from the church after a Christmas gathering. Severe floods interrupted his normal commute home, classic medieval flash floods. So Robert Baker, the quick thinker that he is, he grabbed a tall pole and he just 
Huh? He just vaulted his way over this new stream that had appeared. And then he then continued home. He just carried the stick home and he was like, what have I done? What have I invented? Now at Bumblebee, we don't recommend this as a commute. Don't pull vault over things in general, unless you're a professional, don't do that. Because later on, when attempting that same stunt, Baker's pole snapped mid-leap and he ended up drowning. Yeah, the poor guy bridged the terabithia himself. You don't want anything to happen like that. That's, that's really bad. Again, in 1540, a similar case. Somebody tried to leap over a pond, but the pole wasn't strong strong enough and it broke and they drowned. Do you pull vault? If so, comment down below how scary it is to learn because I'm interested, I don't know. Number four, falling bacon. If they ever made a Final Destination movie that takes place in medieval times, that'd be an odd pitch. This would be the opening scene for sure. This is crazy. Not sure how true this is, but if so, Oh boy, my palms are sweating. It was February 12, 1543, and Elizabeth Brown was working as a servant in the household of a man named Hugh Talmash. Now this was over in Huntingdon. Things were going swimmingly, I guess, until a tragic accident occurred. Elizabeth was the victim of a freak accident while sitting by the kitchen fire. A massive, unsliced chunk of bacon was suspended in the chimney above her to smoke over time. And that day, the rope decided to just go, and then said bacon ended up crushing her. Now, if you're smoking meats, don't put it above or near you. That's a, that's a bizarre way to smoke meat. And also, if you're smoking meat, must be nice. That's a crazy charcuterie board. Number three, outhouse troubles. This next one really stinks, my gosh. If you're eating food right now watching this, maybe skip to number two. I won't take it personally, here we go. On June 2nd, 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan went out to his back garden to use the medieval outhouse, AKA the cesspit. Now today they're built a little differently, but back in the day it was a massive hole with a wooden rim. It wasn't pretty, it didn't smell great, it was horrible, it was made you sick. Now Duncan, the poor lad, rumor has it, he he was a little intoxicated, and Duncan, while doing his business, fell into said cesspit, leading him to suffocate to death in the worst way imaginable. Now, it sounds like a crazy way to go in medieval times, but it can happen today as well. Because in 2014, two people lost their lives trying to recover a cell phone that fell into a porta potty. Yeah, imagine that. Losing consciousness and feces is a dangerous place to do it. That's very horrible. That's a horrible way to go out. That's the worst way to go out, I think. That's the worst. Number two, clocks. Yeah, if you think a piano falling on your head is insane odds, now imagine a clock. Welcome to the medieval times. The 16th century saw the beginning of clock making, and early on, these things, they were units. They were massive. Great, great grandfather clocks, these early mechanical pieces, they were made of metal and were chock full of machinery. Weight equals danger. And in 1513, a man named John Townsend was holding an iron clock, very proud, when all of a sudden it slipped from his hand and it hit the young man right next to him. William Brett it hit him right in the forehead and the next day Brett died of his injuries. Guy died because he got hit with a clock. What a way to go. And finally number one horse racing. I think it's general knowledge at this point but standing near a racehorse equals not a good idea. Right, you heard it here first on Bumblebee. January 16th, 1540, two riders named Henry Headlam and Brian Newton, they were racing back and forth along a wall in a garden right outside of London. Casual medieval time stuff, just racing horses. Now, Newton's horse was going quite fast and Newton didn't realize that he was approaching an elm tree. Now, his head hit a branch from the tree and he broke his neck and died the next day. Now, right after this first tragic death, racing was seen as a danger to spectators and riders. More than fair. Riding a live animal at top speed yeah, that's obviously a little bit dangerous, I would assume. But then in 1534, Jane Jones was just watching, not even riding, she was watching horse racing, and then out of nowhere, a horse trampled her. Yeah, four days later, her injuries got the best of her. So if you're watching any live horse racing this afternoon, I don't know, have some distance maybe. Move up a couple of seats in the stands. Horse racing is big in uh, Ontario for some reason. I don't know, we have like one big one, constantly busy. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the leech collector. This job truly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a person who is responsible for the collection of leeches. The little blood suckers were a popular treatment back in medieval times when just bleeding was a common treatment for a variety of ailments. Headache? Just bleed a bit. Common cold? Have I got a solution for you? Bloodletting, especially by way of leech, was actually used medicinally for thousands of years with possible ties to ancient Egypt. This medical treatment, however, of course, required leeches, which meant that someone needed to collect them. Many leech collectors were people who didn't have a lot of money, and more commonly, women. The job required wading in the water and searching for leeches, and how do you catch them? With your legs, of course. Leech collectors would wait for leeches to latch onto them, and normally would have to wait for about 20 minutes before 
before pulling them off because they were easier to remove after getting fat with blood. How horrible. This already sounds awful, but what's worse is that after being bitten by a leech, the wounds tend to bleed more than a normal cut even would. This was great to get more leeches interested, but bad as a human who was trying to keep blood inside of their body. This job usually led to those who did it to contract illnesses from the leeches, their open wounds, or just have severe blood loss because at the time, people didn't know you could overdo it with bloodletting this way. In our number 9 spot today, we have the fuller. Wool is a clothing staple. It's been used for centuries, but back in medieval times, there was a disgusting part of the job that thankfully doesn't exist anymore, thanks to the invention of modern chemistry. Wool is naturally waterproof due to the fact that it contains oils that have been distributed from the sheep's skin. And these oils are what made the entire harvesting, carting, spinning, and weaving processes possible in these times. This is all fine and well, but the trouble comes in after all of that, because the cloth at the end of it all was coarse and easily frayed. And this is where the job of a fuller came in. They were tasked with removing the oil from the cloth. Okay, a little alkaline solution, no problem, right? Well, yeah. Except for in these times, the most accessible and cheap alkaline solution was stale urine. Yep, just a bunch of old pee. A fuller had to take this new woven material, put it into a tub full of old pee from who knows where, and then you stomp on it with your feet. And then you get no shower at the end of it either. What's a carpenter without his tool belt, right? What I mean is that fullers were also responsible for collecting their own pee to use for the wool. So they often needed to head to all the local public toilets and private homes to collect it. Just gets worse. Worse. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Groom of the Stool. This job doesn't sound too bad with just the title, it weirdly sounds kind of regal. I mean, it was quite a prestigious position during this time, but it also was one of the most humiliating jobs in history. In the medieval times, kings were looked on almost as if they were gods, you know, it's their divine right. And because of this divine right, for centuries, it was deemed improper for a king to wipe his own behind after using the facilities. This is where the Groom of the Stool comes in, this high level noble men would be responsible for fetching the toilet chair for the king when nature called, and he would also be in charge of the wiping aspect of the whole thing. No bidets, I guess, back then. The groom of the stool also played a role in monitoring the king's health, as he was tasked with examining the stool just to watch for any serious changes. And should the king be having some digestive troubles at any point, the groom of the stool would always be nearby and ready to administer a royal enema. In our number 7 spot today, we have the nightman. This is definitely one of the shittiest jobs from the medieval times, and I mean that quite literally. Also referred to as gong farmers, these people had the unfortunate job of cleaning out all of the human waste from the cesspits in the castle walls, which they would then transport to a pre-arranged location where it would be buried. These cesspits were the medieval equivalent to a septic tank, and they were usually located on the lowest level of the castle. The nightmen would end up digging through weeks, months, just sometimes even years of disgustingness, and they were motivated to gather as much as possible possible considering the fact that they were paid by the ton. Imagine, that's a frightening amount of work. The job was also quite hazardous, too. I mean, if we really think about what exactly they are doing, it quickly becomes clear that many of them died from disease, and there was also a good chunk of people who suffocated on the job as well. In our number 6 spot today, we have a sin eater. Okay, this is definitely one of the strangest jobs on this list. The job of a sin eater was to, well, eat sins. To do this, they were tasked with eating a piece of bread that had been placed on the chest of someone who had died. Definitely not an ideal day of work for me personally. The idea behind this was that in consuming the bread, they were consuming the sins of that person so that they could carry on into the afterlife peacefully. Basically, sin eaters were willing to sacrifice their own souls and their own eternal happiness just to make some money while they were alive. I'm not sure what's worse, taking the risk with the sins or eating bread from off of a dead person. I don't know, both bad. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Executioner. We have all heard of this job before. After all, an important aspect of the medieval times was the fact that they were trying to have better criminal law enforcement, which naturally meant that a ton of people were getting executed for their crimes. While there is of course now the stereotype of people who did this work as being these huge hooded evil people, history shows that this stereotype is largely untrue. Most of the people who fell into this job didn't come into it because they wanted to. In fact, most people
people of course saw this job as being undesirable, but the job usually was bestowed upon them. Sometimes butchers were called for the job because of relevant experience, other times it was criminals who could either do the job or face their own death sentence, and most commonly, people found themselves in the job because their fathers had been executioners before them. Aside from the nitty gritty of the job, I mean the horrors of the work itself, it's obvious, another part of being an executioner that sucked was the fact that people didn't really want to associate with you. Executioners were usually on the fringes of society and outcast, sometimes even forced to actually live on the edge of town. In our number 4 spot today we have cat gut. Back in the medieval times, they didn't have the technology we have now, or even the technology that was available in the 17th century when it came to making strings for instruments such as the violin, but they still did have violins around, so how? Well, in comes the invention of cat gut, which thankfully is not made of cat guts, but it is made of sheep's guts. Okay, really had you in the first half there. Violin string makers during this time would make the strings by basically twisting strands of sheep innards together. Their job would require them to butcher the animal in a very careful way, making sure not to rupture the stomach or the lower intestines. The process could take hours just to get the required materials from the animal. The insides then needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution for a good cleaning, but they needed to be monitored at all times to ensure that they weren't beginning to spoil, which is horrible. From here, the drying process began, and after that, it was time for twisting. In our number 3 spot today, we have the rat catcher. Another job that really is just what it sounds like. Rat catchers had quite a busy time during the medieval times. There was a rat problem, and these rats were filthy and full of disease, and someone needed to catch them. Castles were often filled with extra grain, vegetables, and herbs in the case of emergency, and this led to the perfect environment for rats and mice. Even before the connection were drawn between rats and disease, people hated them, and this is because they would eat your food. A bad rat infestation for a person without much actually could have been a death sentence for them during this time. This meant that people really appreciated rat catchers in society, although the job wasn't a great one, was clearly risky, and also was largely ineffective. Rat catchers would sometimes try and use spells, sometimes they would use herbs as a sort of poison, and sometimes they'd even use the good old leave the body as a warning to the other rats trick. Yeah, wonder why it didn't work. In our number 2 spot today we have the treadmill operator. This is a job that sucked during the medieval times because it was boring, it's basically like a human hamster wheel, but also because it was incredibly dangerous and not for those who were afraid of heights. Treadmill operators would normally be placed at the highest point of a structure, and the wheel they were stepping on was the top half of like a pulley system to help things be hoisted up as they were building said, you know, structure that they're at the top of. This is a practice that started in ancient Rome and was reintroduced in the Middle Ages. This was actually a job that was commonly given to people who were blind because the fear of heights dissuaded a lot of people from doing this job, which only makes it probably more dangerous. In our number one spot today, we have the lime burner. Lime mortar has been a common and important building material for years, stemming back to the first century BC, but despite its importance, it's not exactly easy to work with. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone and this was the job of a lime burner. They needed to take the stone and heat it in a kiln at around 800 degrees Celsius. Sounds easy enough for sure, except for the fact that the job meant that you were constantly being exposed to rooms full of carbon monoxide and dust chalk that was capable of removing your ability to breathe. And also, just to top it all off, there's also a high risk that once the stone was done heating, it might also explode if it comes into contact with water. So. Better hope none of your sweat drips down onto it or else things are not good. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed two men in the building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and I'm immediately back inside, that's it. I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name, my lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references maybe, I don't know, it's kind of 
horrible. In the Middle Ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here, and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped. And it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now the death toll here, I mean, obviously it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames? Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surnames were a little bit different. They were descriptions, almost, about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. Red signified his red hair. Makes sense, Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old, got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time, because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, uh, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pie. Nice. Here you go. For you and yours. Enjoy. Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no. But they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table. You're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others join in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks and the authorities tried their best to help the situation, so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. It was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill. Number five, Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified. And once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise. Hard to get out of your mind. Radio carbon tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of face pareidolia? Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I like at our producer Chris. I see Jesus every day right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May into October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. 
of that. Cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly, it was far too cold for them to even stand a chance, and it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean, like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Now yeah, talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? No. Number two, plague bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now, bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers, show of hands? Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away and then they would bury them right just way over there great idea honestly the further the better couldn't agree more a church would house these plagued souls away from society now it sounds sad but this was the best call all things considered so no you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon and finally number one medieval punishment cleaner this one really sucks best for last here we go back in medieval times many executions were public the town would come out watch a hanging or two and then grab some bread and then head home they're like hey classic sunday this was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johann, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, and with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray ball. They're like, hey, which table boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. You're gonna be doing it a lot. Like a lot, a lot. Slander is number 10. Imagine seeing some random dude in the market square holding his nose and shouting about how he was a liar. Honestly, wasn't weird under the Norman law from 1066 to 1154. If you committed the act of slander, on top of paying damages to those whose reputation you may have affected, you also had to do the holding of the nose. This law was enacted by Pouty, first king of Norman, who had spent his whole life on the throne being called William the Bastard for his parents' unmarried status. In return, turn, he exacted this silly law that required the slanderer to stand in the center of town, as previously described, holding their nose and shouting about their lies. Public humiliation has long since been an effective means of preventing crime. And just about anything. Number 9 is Jenny cragging it. Edward III of England was so tired of his royal court and nobility being heavier set that he made an entire law about it. In 1336, the new law stated obesity made people not able to aid themselves nor their liege lord in time of need. Edward mandated a maximum belt size and also, if you watch part one, implemented food restrictions, banning more than two courses with the exception of holy days. Edward even defined soup as a separate course to prevent people from calling that a sauce or a condiment. This law lasted remarkably until 1856. Its main purpose in the long run had likely become beneficial economically to ensure that England's resources could be employed more effectively in the upcoming war with the French. Still, regardless, he seems like a fat shaming dude. 
German purity law is number eight. Beer is Germany's national drink, and that's nothing new. The Germans have been indulging for thousands of years. Typically, beer was produced in groups and always made of pure grain, until the purity laws made by Wilhelm IV in 1516 Bavaria. Germans, and most people of the medieval and middle ages, didn't drink water as it was often deeply contaminated. They drank beer. The law imposed was aimed at preventing crops used to make bread from being squandered on brewing, so it stipulates that only water, barley, and hops were allowed to be used as key ingredients for beer production. At first, brewers thought this was ludicrous and unusual to decide, but turns out Wilhelm was actually onto something with this combination. This original law went on to become the core of German beer purity laws that affect German brewing to this day, which makes them the oldest regulations related to food and drink in the world. The only change to it in recent history was the adding of yeast. The Brewers Association of Germany wants the five century old law governing how German beer is made to become part of the UNESCO World Heritage List. It would join the Argentinian tango, Iranian carpet weaving, and French gastronomy, among other famous traditions that are considered unique and worth protecting. Let's talk sumptuary laws with the Spanish garment laws, number seven in the countdown. Sumptuary laws, which we discussed in part one, are placed in to control the nobility and their consumption and displays of material goods. In the case of Spain, there are many sumptuary laws in place as early as the Spartan era. In the 13th century, for example, Siena passed a provision reducing the trains on women's dresses, which was a direct effort to curb a purely aristocratic style. In 1356, the city of Florence proclaimed it illegal for women to have buttons on their clothing without a corresponding buttonhole. And also, no one other than the king was illegally permitted to wear a scarlet rain cape. Also in Florence, it was studied how sumptuary legislation around fashion served as a tool to encourage marriage in a society where excessive extravagance of men providing clothing for the women and their families exasperated the custom of very expensive dowries. If her standards were already up, you had to work harder to pay for her, I guess. And a delay in marriage did mean a dip in population. While there are ample examples of the laws themselves, similar to many other sumptuary laws, there's virtually no record of their enforcements or punishments. Oftentimes this is because nobility themselves violated their own laws that they made for themselves. Without evidence of how exactly these laws were enforced or whether they were enforced at all, it remains extremely difficult to discuss their social impact, the attitude civilians had towards them as well. Did they act accordingly so as not to face legal difficulties or the payment of fines? Who knows? Not us. So on to the next. Refusing knighthood comes in at number six. This law was put into place in 1233. Why you may ask? Because simply put, being a knight sucked. If you saw our last video, you may remember hearing about how insanely taxed knights were, but on top of that you had to pay for a ton of mandatory clothes, train incessantly, pay the king for serving him, and don't forget the custom sized armor. You lose or gain weight, you're gonna have to pay to replace whole pieces. That's on top of the potential of dying in a battle you just don't care for. No, not many people wanted to be a knight. Roger of Dudley refused to attend his own knighting when he learned he'd have to pay for it. In response to his refusal, Henry III on the spot passed a law against refusing the knighthood. He forcefully knighted Dudley and also confiscated his land to boot. Yikes. Number five is the legal protection of claiming sanctuary. Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame depicts an iconic scene of Quasimodo swinging around on rope dramatically over the burning base of the Notre. Having just saved Esmeralda from an execution, he holds her aloft in the cathedral's terrace and screams out sanctuary. Sanctuary actually predates Christianity and originates far back into the 300s and existed until the 16th century. Every medieval law folded to the protections of sanctuary no matter the criminal's crime. Now, sanctuary seeking criminals might have been required to perform penance or go into exile, but they were at least guaranteed immunity from punishment. That's right, you could literally strangle someone and then run to the church to claim sanctuary and no one could come in and harm, arrest, or remove you for punishment. Sanctuary was abolished due to the new tide of judicial law and the arguments of crime, power, and punishment. Also because people should be punished for, I don't know, maybe taking someone else's life. Originally, before Christianity, it was temples such as the ones in Greek and Rome offering the solace, and it was part of the Roman law by the end of the fourth century to have it. Christianity adopted this practice to try and persuade people to join their religion when it started. Even after the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, churches maintained their authority to protect people who had broken major secular laws. Number four, let's meet the yellow ladies. Venice, Italy was an important trading post. Many people came and went, many travelers came to see the great city. But for those who had been at sea for a while, they may have wanted to see a little something else. As a result, medieval Venice was a massive red light district, enjoyed by many before their next 
next voyages. Trying to control the number of ladies working the streets, the Venetian government mandated in 1360 that brothels must be concentrated in the market and port districts. Obviously that just made their industry boom more since it was concentrated right where all the money came in and not dispersed, requiring men to travel farther out in convenient ways. Angry now that they weren't at least getting to capitalize off the potential tax revenue of these women, they in 1420 decided to be accommodative of their Lady of the Night friends, the Venetian government accommodated more red light districts and implemented safety means within them, as well as the law of yellow. All women of the trade were to wear shades of yellow so as to be identifiable to their clientele, so random ladies just out on a stroll who happen to be in the area don't get harassed. But also it's a little bit of that classic shame tactic of making someone unwanted easily identifiable for discrimination. Number 3 is the indigenous sumptuaries of Spain. As early as 1501, the crown warned natives who carried sword, dagger, or any other weapons that they face confiscation and may be condemned to more punishments according to what the court sees fit. Spanish restrictions against natives developed through the 16th century. This mandate is no surprise as these items, while dangerous, complemented and enhanced men's fashions. And fashionable rapiers became integral to everyday masculine attire in Europe. To the indigenous, they had been items of necessity to carry and often seen as symbolic. For indigenous men of the elite, the right to bear arms highlighted much more than their privileged status the way that it did for the colonizer. It demonstrated colonial acknowledgement of their once dominant standing on their original lands and partially vindicated their marginalized reality even as a royal. June 8, 1685, Don Diego Garcia, an indigenous leader of what's now Guerrero, had petitioned to the Viceroy of New Spain to intervene on his behalf when this sumptuary denied him the right his parents, grandparents, and ancestors had always possessed. Garcia was one of 505 petitions submitted by 277 towns between 1575 and 1693 demanding change. In response to a perceived disregard for the law, the monarchy reissued the restrictions six more times over the course of the next 70 years. The items requested by Don Diego Garcia reflected both indigenous and European definitions of masculinity. By focusing on European attire and the personal weapons, Garcia took advantage of the social currency imposed by Spanish colonizers. As an elite, Garcia faced decreased political power and increased marginalization under a new regime. Garments and swords provided the ability to visually assert himself in everyday life. Ultimately, petitions submitted by Garcia and his peers reflected not just a request for a special status item, but an attempt to assert their belonging as an elite man in a colonial life. Number two is just absurd, but you can club a Swede. If they cross the frozen sea between Denmark and Sweden. What? This unusual law was imposed during the Dano-Swedish Wars of 1657 to 58. King Charles Gustav of Sweden had been planning to cross the Orsand by ship, but the freezing temperatures of January changed that plan. Frozen solid, the Swedes realized that they could simply just walk across. This completely caught the Danes off guard as no attack had been predicted until the spring and they scrambled to compensate. Ultimately, the Danes signed the Treaty of Rockskild and yielded to the territory dispute. But ever since that day, should you see a Swede crossing over the frozen sea on foot, you are legally free to swing a big old club at him. And finally, at number one, you either tuck it or you lose it. Medieval Wales was not playing around when it came to women being violated. If you were caught or perpetrator of this heinous crime, your options were to pay a dowry or get the little man chopped off. That's right, a violation such as this was actually considered a theft and was treated as such by the law. Should a perp pay the dowry, then legally the woman's virginity or body was restored in legal parameters. Can't or won't pay the fine? Well then, that was the end of down there for you. The reason for this, other than it being morally right, is that the fines and punishments hope to stop families from developing harmful feuds which would damage the wider society as a whole. This was not exclusive to Wales, however. This punishment shows up in the 1750s code of Constinian Marvodokat in Eastern Europe. It was not unheard of for women to also simply just take the law into their hands either. In a rural area of Shropshire near the Welsh border in 1405, Isabella Grawernus and her two daughters ambushed her attacker in a field, tied him up, and did the dreaded snip snip and stole his horses to boot. All three women were subsequently pardoned. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Pope Gregory the Ninth. Pope Gregory the Ninth was the Bishop of Rome and the ruler of the Papal States from 1227 and until his passing in 1241. The Papal States were a series of territories in the Italian peninsula that were under direct rule of the Pope from the 8th century all the way to 1870. It turns out that Pope Gregory IX had a very strange hatred for cats. He said that black cats were actually instruments of Satan, which seems a little extreme, but then he actually went as far as to order that they be exterminated throughout Europe, which is 
definitely a little extreme. With this order, the Pope's followers had to oblige, and there was a drastic reduction in the cat population. But of course, this caused a disturbance to the ecosystem, and the time and the consequence of that became very evident. Because of the decline of cats, there was a sudden increase in the amount of rats, most of which may have been carrying the plague. There are a lot of historians who would argue that this war on cats may have had a huge effect on the severity of the Black Plague. That is, of course, speculation as it's pretty difficult to pinpoint who could be at fault for something like that, but it certainly is a very interesting point. This all really does, however, bring me to my next point. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Black Death. I'm sure we've all heard of the Black Death at some point or another. I mean, how could we possibly ever stop talking about something like that? During the 1340s, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague that spread rapidly throughout Europe and Asia. It was called the Black Plague because of the fact that this illness would cause people's lymph nodes to become swollen and black. The Black Death was absolutely terrible, and it caused a lot of agony for those who had to go through it. Symptoms included things like severe body aches, fever, vomiting, and eventual death in most cases. There was no cure for the plague, so it just continued to spread. In the end, the Black Death took the lives of hundreds of millions of people. We now all know firsthand what it is like to live through a pandemic, and I certainly wouldn't sign up to do it again anytime soon, so I'm most definitely sure the times of the Black Death were some of the worst times in history. Apparently, it is said that if you lived in the 1340s, there was basically a 50-50 chance that you'd survive the Black Death. And then on top of that, there's all of the other horrifying ways to die that the medieval times held. All in all, I'm kind of shocked that we're still here today. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Mongol Invasion. Being in China during the Mongol Invasion certainly was a terrifying time. I'm sure a lot of us here have heard at least some of the stories surrounding Genghis Khan, but if you haven't, let's just say that being on his bad side certainly wasn't a good thing for you. In 1205, when the Mongol invasion in China began, it was the regular citizens of China who paid the ultimate price. What was started by Genghis Khan was carried on by his son and then his grandson, which ultimately led to a 74 year long campaign that was filled with brutality and destruction. Cities and towns were destroyed, empires were brought down, and millions of completely innocent people lost their lives. It is believed that this invasion took the lives of enough people to cut the population in half from 100 and 20 million before to just 60 million after. Anyone living in China at this time would have had to live in absolute fear of being killed for something that you really had nothing to do with. That would be awful and absolutely terrifying. In our number 7 spot today, we have Pope Formosus and Pope Stephen VI. Pope Formosus was the ruler of the Papal States from October 6th, 891, until he passed away on April 4th, 896. After his passing, Pope Boniface VI took his place as ruler for just a few weeks before he also passed away, which then left Pope Stephen VI as the ruler from then on until his death. After this whirlwind April of 1896, things got even weirder. Before his passing, Pope Formosus had sided with Arnulf of Carinthia against Lambert of Spoleto, which was definitely not okay with Pope Stephen VI. So once Pope Stephen VI gets to the place of being the ruler, he gets the people to exhume the body of Pope Formosus so that he can put him on trial. I feel like this is very gross and very unnecessary, but this really is the type of stuff that went on in the 800s. They propped the body up for trial and had a deacon answer questions for him since he obviously was unable to do that himself. They ended up finding the corpse guilty, which seems a little unfair, and they actually went as far as to strip the body of its sacred vestments, took three fingers from the right hand as they were the blessing fingers, they dressed the body in regular people clothes, instead of the clothing a pope would be buried in, and then they reburied the body. If this poor man's body hadn't been through enough, it was later re-exhumed, again, and thrown into the river. If this story wasn't already wild enough, this whole debacle is actually what would later end up getting Pope Stephen imprisoned and then killed, all right? So I guess the other pope had his justice in the end. I don't know, man. In our number six spot today, we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him hacking up 
nights, imagining that he was Saint George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was completely abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances blocked off. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Italian Renaissance dark side. Just at the tail end of the years of the medieval period, as we transitioned into the Renaissance period, began the Italian Renaissance. When we think of the Italian Renaissance period, it is known for the development and the rebirth that it caused, which makes a lot of sense considering the word Renaissance means rebirth. But there is one less glamorous and slightly frightening side to this period that isn't always spoken about. Sailors who had been returning from the New World at this point brought something less than lovely back with them, and that was syphilis, which spread through an entire French army. After this, the troops brought what was called the Great Pox to the rest of Europe. Since there was no penicillin back then, the disease spread rapidly and the symptoms were pretty gruesome. It would often happen that the person who had fallen ill would have the skin on their faces essentially be rotting away, which would leave large ulcers. Sometimes people's noses or lips would be pretty much gone, and it happened often that people would very sadly pass away from the disease. So basically, what we think of as a really beautiful time in Europe was both world changing, but also very scary and like, I don't know, kind of close to a zombie apocalypse. In our number four spot today, we have William the Conqueror. In 1087, William the Conqueror decided to take on an all alcohol diet. This is because he was suffering from extreme obesity and was struggling because of that fact. Because of this, he told his staff that he would only drink wine until his weight went down, but he ended up passing away less than a year later. And most of us are told that obviously this was because of the wine only diet. That's actually not true. In an astonishing turn of events, this wine only diet actually worked. Shortly after beginning his diet, he was able to ride his horse again, which was one of the main reasons he started the diet in the first place, as he was previously too heavy for the horse to carry. He actually died after falling from his horse during an expedition, which was completely unrelated to either his weight or his diet. It's entirely possible that had he not gone on this diet, he would have never ridden his horse and maybe would have lived longer? Truthfully, who knows? But I suppose in a very roundabout way, he did still kind of die from his wine only diet. In our number three spot today, we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed and during the time her son was too young to rule just yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out by using scalding hot water. Yeah. Don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it really doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. It seemed like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slang, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from. She divided a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she definitely was not okay. In our number two spot today, we have Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was a deputy to the ruler of the Mali Empire, but when the ruler went missing while on a sea voyage to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, Mansa Musa became the ruler in 1312. During during his rule, European nations were really struggling due to civil wars and a lack of resources, but the Mali Empire was flourishing because of their abundance of resources like gold and salt. Under his rule, the empire grew to take up a large portion of West Africa as he conquered 24 cities and their surrounding districts. At this time, Mali was one of the top producers of gold in the entire world, which left Mansa Musa as one of the wealthiest historical figures ever. One of the most well-known 
events during his rule was the pilgrimage to Mecca. This journey took place from 1324 to 1325 and spanned an estimated 4,000 miles, and it was the first time people outside of the empire saw just how wealthy he was. He traveled with 60,000 of his men, all wearing Persian silk, along with 12,000 slaves who each carried four pounds of gold bars, and he also brought heralds who had golden staffs, along with a bunch of camels and horses. This pilgrimage had a profound effect on Egypt as this huge group of people passed through. From the markets in Cairo to the royals to the impoverished people that crossed their path, Musa left Cairo littered with so much gold that it depreciated the value of the metal in Egypt and it took decades for them to recover. In our number one spot today, we have St. Marcellus's Flood. This was actually a very serious extra tropical cyclone that swept through around January 16th, 1362. This cyclone eerily matched up with the new moon and it spanned through the British Isles, the Netherlands, Northern Germany, and Denmark. Here's the thing, this storm not only lined up with the moon, but also peaked on the feast day of St. Marcellus, which is the reason it got its name, but usually people refer to this one as the second because there is another. The first St. Marcellus flood took the lives of 36,000 people as it swept through the Northern Netherlands in 1219. The second flood, however, while no one is sure the exact numbers, it is estimated that at least 250,000 people lost their lives. While there have been plenty of devastating floods in history, this one is said to be blamed on Atlantic gales and that this event goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. First up, since we've heard a decent bit about nights before, let's start with training day. Or days, uh, well, years. The joke still landed. Whatever. Training for nights began around age 7 and it would take an average of 14 years before they were ready to battle. Essentially like going to middle and high school today. And like the school system, you moved up through the levels. Potential knights started as pages who essentially acted as an assistant or servant to their assigned lord. Most of the training for pages began practicing with dull weapons, learning to master riding a horse, take part in hunts, and otherwise do menial tasks. At 14, pages would become squires, assuming they were still in good physical health and not a raging socio or psychopath. According to medieval Britain, once a page became a squire, he had to master the seven points of agility, which was just a really long list of sporting events. So things like shooting, fencing, wrestling, riding horses, swimming and diving, climbing, long jumping, tournaments, sports like jousting, and dancing. Okay, so that's more than seven points of agility and dancing was in there, so let's just agree that medieval logic was a bit strange and their math skills were bad and we can move on. After approximately five to seven years of this higher training, if they survived and had mastered all the required skills, they'd usually be officially knighted and that's usually at age 19 to 22. You weren't taught to have your own opinions, but people are people and that's why sometimes a knight had to battle their conscience. As a knight, you were serving God. But what did that mean? A knight could go his whole life without having the clouds overhead opening up and God sticking his head through to yell specific directions at him out of everyone on earth to choose from. So he had to turn elsewhere for guidance. Okay, so what do we got here? Well, there's, there's the priest, or you could ask the king who by virtue was a direct mouthpiece of God, which by the way is super convenient to be packing when you want to do things like seduce courtiers or chop off people's heads. God said I could, ha ha. But this also means a knight is always beholden to kings and that mouthpiece of his. Whether or not the orders agreed with the knight's conscience, the orders came from God and he was dedicated to that God. So what happened to knights who disobeyed that or somehow dishonored themselves? The ones who the king hits up and said, yo, I'm gonna have your wife tonight or go execute this blind person for bumping into me. And their response was anything other than, oh yeah, 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 man, do whatever you want. Well, a king gave the knight his spurs so he could also take him away. According to noble dynasty, when a knight who did something treasonous or cowardly, let me uh, correct, was just accused of doing something treasonly or cowardly because there didn't have to be proof, he got publicly stripped of knighthood in a formal ceremony, then executed. And seeing as being a knight meant that could happen at any second, X marks the plot. There must have been those knights with existentialism, the ones who laid up at night wondering if all the infidel killing and pervy chivalry and pillaging and holy calling stuff, what if it's almost but not enough 
to get you into heaven. Which means you could do pretty much everything right as a knight and still spend sleepless nights worrying that you wouldn't make it past the pearly gates. They were a super religious lot after all. In anticipation of solving this problem, a lot of knights, well those who made it past their youth anyway, would often join a military order because membership usually came with a plot in a church graveyard. And seeing as they believed even people who were completely without sin could not be guaranteed a place in heaven unless they were buried in a certain kind of dirt, that's better than a pension. And no, not any dirt would do, it had to be consecrated dirt of a church graveyard. According to ancient history encyclopedia, an aging knight would sometimes even enlist at the last possible second for battle so he could be interred beneath a lovely stone effigy in church forever without needing to do or spend any time doing boring churchy stuff. Our world loves class divide and that's no different back then, when it sucked to be a poor knight. On that note, contrary to popular belief, not all knights were wealthy with castles and serfs and all that bougie middle age luxury. In fact, some weren't even landowners at all, and the rank of knight was more or less something that made one a minor noble like your auntie on city council. Though, of course, many among the knighted held higher positions in nobility separate from their knightly status. This is to do with knighthood becoming a nepo baby industry. The lowest class of these knights might even live in their lord's homes, serving more or less as bodyguards, security, occasionally law enforcement, and sometimes judges mediating local disputes. In essence, their day to day was a bit of a mashup between soldier and civil law enforcement. It's like those people you met who wanted to become a cop for the fast action and the pew pew and the speed chases, then learn it's 80% paperwork and painfully slow regiment. As you might imagine, lower ranked and poor knights love tournaments for a chance to gain prestige, practice their skills, and the chance to acquire additional wealth via prizes and ransoms and the like. So tournaments is next on our list because they were essentially medieval mud melees. Since knights started at not nosed kids, it was easy to build the ideology of tournaments as fun and exciting into them, the foundation of competitiveness. In the 13th century, tournaments were particularly bloody and death was not uncommon. Initially, the games and tournaments were a little more than massive melees, usually including real sharpened weapons, there were no rules, and tensions were made intensely high because often they'd group the knights by nation or clan, then pit them against each other that way. Call whoever had that idea Taylor Swift because they wanted bad blood. That said, the general point, unlike real battle, was not to intentionally kill your opponent, but just to knock them off their horse, steal their armor and horse, and take them prisoner until the tourney is over. That being said, dull weapons weren't introduced into tournaments for hundreds of years, and they also used lances to launch each other off of horses at full speed, so realistically death is inevitable. One notable tournament took place in 1274 when King Edward I was pitted against the Count of Shalons. As the king and the count battled it out, dozens of soldiers from each side got involved and lost their lives. And these tournaments often took up whole villages. This is because they weren't much different from actual battle, so knights could take off and hide in a peasant's house from the opposing team, which was often then ransacked and burnt. Essentially, being a medieval peasant was like living in Avengers Universe New York, where at any second your whole house could be obliterated in a blink and you miss it style by a group of battling morons. Losing your life can suck, but so can losing your gear, because knights buy their own armor. The biggest barrier to entry for those who are peasants or serf turned knight was the absurdly high cost of equipment. Remember, this was centuries before governments decide to arm their troops for combat. You want to be blessed by the divine right to be controlled by me, the king, your whole life and have no freedom, property, life, money, individualism of your own, only to die stupidly in a field somewhere? Well, you also need to buy your own armor. Being a knight was a fat ripoff. Mostly you were paid in land ownership or sometimes just by the glory of your lord. And that's because the system benefited noblemen who grew up in it, not much different from how things work nowadays. So any armor or weapons you needed had to be purchased on the side. With money, you were never given. It's no problem for the knights of noble birth, but other knights would have to work the land and sell goods just to earn enough. Yes, it is also a tin can and it's one size only. Have fun rebuying pieces when weight fluctuates. One outlier though is new research and digital recreations show that knights were actually able to tumble, climb, chop wood, jump on horses, and run quite easily all in armor. So if you're scared of never being able to fit in again, never get out of it. Not like they washed much anyways. And while it can keep you safe, it can put a target on your back too. Held for Ransom is next. And if you've ever watched a movie such as Gladiator, Braveheart, 300, Troy, to name a few, then you may recall that some dudes always wore special armor during battle, and some wore none. If you were rich enough or important enough, you could have the best 
best of the best armor, made of the strongest but lightest materials to gain a defensive edge on the battlefield, all at the low, low price of your daddy's money. And it wasn't exclusive to any kingdom, so that means in one, oh, moment for everyone battling one another, knights realized that if they saw opponents in incredibly strong or elaborate armor, not to kill that guy, but keep him. Captured instead, a ransom could be demanded for a nobleman knight, because only well-off knights wore such good armor, so that's what you get for flashing your stack, I guess. Worst case Ontario, if the ransom doesn't work out and none of your boys are a sizes 12 to 88 in tin seam, you can melt them down for some pieces of your own. Hey, what sucked more than the medieval knight? being married to one. Like so many of the sickest jobs in history, being a knight was exclusively reserved for the owners of a ding -a -ling. Their wives were expected to sit at home, not learning to kill people with a broadsword or pile driving her buddies into a pile of dung, their bloodlust going offensively unsatiated. Unless their husband died like a moron, that is. In that case, in a very un Middle Ages twist, women were expected to fulfill all their husband's knightly duties. This included protecting their new lord and making sure his land didn't fall into disrepair. Only women didn't get any of the cool stuff that came with it, like respect or equality or acknowledgement by history. They got armor though, which which is pretty sick. Unsurprisingly, the wives seldom waited for their husbands to get gored by a lance before getting all up in the business of running the show. He could literally drop at any time, so homegirl had to be ready. This resulted in knight wives actually being significantly more skilled and diplomatically inclined than their husbands. The duties generally expected of a knight's wife included everything from organizing the defenses of their state to arranging marriages for their servants. This was on top of being at beck and call for their husbands 24 hours a day. I wonder how many of these men really met their ends of their own accord, and how many met their end when she didn't need him anymore. It has the effect Taco Bell has on the average 21st century person. Dentistry. Dentistry is a disease caused by tainted food and drink, causing intestinal inflammation, leading to excessively frequent and uncontrollable diarrhea to the point of death. So yeah, Taco Bell. Generally, no one was safe. A fact 15th century Italian polemist Girolamo Savona, the Savonarola made clear when he observed that dentistry affected not only in the same house, but in the entire locale, and moving from a child of 10 or 15 to a sexagenarian. Savonarola himself came down with the disease in 1495. Now this included knights, battling knights. On English invasion of France, King Henry II had brought a well-trained and disciplined army who were riddled with this disease. The tough-tested veterans could handle the fever and the fatigue, but the constant loss of bowel control presented a massive, stinky problem on the eve of an already ominous battle. So, the English set up their position on one side of a narrow field, which lay between two forested areas. The narrow approach allowed the limited number of men-at-arms to stretch across the front, while the archers took stationary positions on the flanks angled inward with a row of protective stakes in front. Thanks to their stationary positions, the archers suffering from dentistry simply dropped their pants and shot their arrows. They also dipped their arrows in it to add insult to injury as the world's worst psychological and bio-warfare duo. I mean, can you imagine an arrow covered in that flying at you? Yeah, they won. By a lot. And topping our list is a reminder that our mental well-being is not solely a thing of the present. It's PTSD. From crime statistics and letters of pardons, historians can see that people in the Middle Ages were no more violent than we are today. And yes, they exercised it in its most extreme forms, but this violence was not through nature nor culture, rather simple direction. Whilst following their orders, those battle experiences could leave them with a very serious case of PTSD. This is backed up by a book that was actually written by a knight who lived in the first half of the 14th century. His name was Girofi de Charny, and he was one of the most respected knights of his age. The book about the life of a knight actually includes the psychological consequences. These symptoms ring true of PTSD. In his book, de Charny advises knights on how to relate to the fact that they must kill people when they are at war, how to mentally endure the hardships knights face, poor sleep, hunger, emotional numbness, loneliness, and a feeling that even nature is going against them. Modern military psychology enables us to read medieval texts like these, or ones of Egypt or Greek battles, and the Mongol spread all in a new way, giving us insight into the perception of violence in the Middle Ages in the general population. In history, we've had a horrible habit of misinterpreting. E 
easy mistake as inflection doesn't appear on paper or stone or stone tablets. Previously, medieval texts were read as worshipping heroes and glorifying violence, but in the light of modern military psychology, we can see the mental cost to knights and of their participation in the gruesome and extreme violent wars in the Middle Ages. Number 10, trial by jury. The concept of trial by jury can be traced back to ancient Greece and Rome. Don't get me wrong, that's old school. But the first recorded use of a modern jury system that dates back to the 12th century England. Medieval England, yes, let's get some men in a room and point at witches. Henry II introduced the practice to replace previous methods of trial, which at that point was relying on physical combat or divine intervention, all that kind of like that. Under this new system, a group of 12 men from the community would be chosen to hear evidence and determine the guilt or innocence of said accused. Right? A little better. A little, you know, less witchcraft, more, okay, we're all talking now. We're conversing. This system gradually spread throughout Europe and then beyond, so on and Danforth, and it became an important cornerstone of many modern legal systems. Back in the day, this was a noble deed. It was an honor to be part of the jury, you know? Today, not, not really so much. Not the same at all. You're like, what? No, I don't want to do that. It's gonna take so long. It's gonna be like four weeks of jury duty. I haven't done it yet. I've just jinxed myself. I'm gonna get called any day now. Don't answer, you know what I mean? Just don't answer your mail, don't look, just avoid it. That's what I do. Number nine, the stocks. All right, relax stock bros. I'm not talking about those stocks. I'm talking medieval stocks. Those ones are a bit different. Those ones were very bad. Those are all bad. The stocks were a common form of punishment in medieval times. The convicted person's ankles were locked into these wooden boards with holes for their feet and stuff, and their hands were sometimes also restrained. We've seen this before. Usually people are like this. You go to a theme park, you pose with your family in one of these things, you're like, hey, I'm stuck. You're like, get me out, this is scary. They would be left in public spaces like that, such as the marketplace or town square, anywhere public because, why of course, you know, shame, shame, we gotta shame everyone back then. And if that wasn't bad enough, the accused would then be pelted with food or even physically attacked by the crowd. Imagine that, imagine being so sparse for food and you're like, yeah, let's throw our bread at that guy. It's like, what, what a waste, we need that. The duration of the punishment is varied, but it could range from a few hours to several days. Yeah, locked up like this for days at a time. What a joke. It was used for various crimes, theft, drunkenness, and slander. And it was intended to humiliate and shame the offender while also serving as a deterrent to others. Guys like, oh, I'd hate to be that guy over there. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's throw food at him now. Sick, so dumb, so dumb. Number eight, the drunkard's cloak. Yeah, this one's uh, quite funny. Not really, but we'll see. The drunkard's cloak, also known as the barrel or the shaming cloak. Again, shame, shame, big important step back there. This is a humiliating punishment used in medieval times for people who were drunk or disorderly in public. This person, this drunk person, they were forced to wear a large barrel or a cloak made of wood or heavy cloth, something big and obvious with holes cut out for their heads and arms. Like they're a big mascot, a big barrel mascot in medieval times. And sometimes they would have offensive messages or images painted on it. You know what I mean? Like the piece of paper that says, kick me. That was like the old school version of that, much worse. The person would then be paraded through town in this garment, this outfit, this big barrel and not fun, often with crowds throwing garbage or food at them. You know, that kind of medieval Game of Thrones stuff. This punishment was intended to publicly shame the person as well. So yeah, shame and then we'll go into the rough nitty gritty stuff at the end here. Number seven, eavesdropping. Eavesdropping back in the day. I mean, today we've all done it, right? We've all listened at some point in our lives to somebody we don't know. Every time I hear somebody in our hallway, in our apartment, I have to look, right? I'm like, who is it? Someone breaking in. But if you did it during the dark ages, if you listened in on a conversation you weren't supposed to hear, well, there were some serious consequences that were waiting for you. Eavesdropping was considered a serious crime back then. That's why they're always whispering in Game of Thrones. Now it makes sense, right? The act of secretly listening in on someone's conversation without out their knowledge and or consent while this crime was viewed as a breach of privacy and trust. <sighs> How dare thee? It was often associated with other crimes such as treason or espionage. This was a big bat. Espionage? Are you kidding? Just because you heard someone say something? Get out of here. Punishments here could include fines, public humiliation, classic, imprisonment, or yeah, remember what happened to Littlefinger in Game of Thrones? Not great. There's worse stuff that could be done. Yikes. Horrible. Number six, Pacific hunting. Yeah, you gotta be sure which, uh, where you throw an arrow back then. In medieval England, the hunting of the king's deer was considered a very serious crime. Yeah, not that deer. That one's fine, but just don't you hit that one. Mm -mm. The act of killing or even injuring a deer was punished harshly under the royal forest law, which was enforced by the king's foresters. That'd be a cool 
job just rolling through the forest looking for people. The law applied only to the king's forests, which were areas of land set aside specifically for hunting for his food. Violators could be subjected to a variety of punishments, including fines, imprisonments, and even mutilation. Yeah, a little different than public humiliation. It's just mutilation this time. This law was meant to preserve the deer population for the king's personal use and enjoyment and served as a way for the monarchy to maintain control over the forest and the resources that it provided. So if you want food, go to that shitty forest over there. It's not even a forest, it's like a marsh. It's horrible. It's like three frogs left. Good luck. Number five. Heretic's Fork. Yeah, a lot like this. This one sucked. The medieval Heretic's Fork was a device used during the Inquisition to punish individuals accused of heresy. You hear the wrong stuff, and then you say the wrong stuff. No matter what you do, bad punishment awaits. Some fork's going in a place you don't want it to be. This punishment consisted of a long metal fork with two prongs that were placed under the chin and the sternum of the accused, making it so you had to stay upright, or else, yeah, not good. The device was designed to keep the person awake and prevent them from speaking and or swallowing, and if they do so, it would cause extreme pain. The prongs here could be adjusted to vary the amount of pressure applied, and the device was often left in place for hours or, again, like the other punishment, even days at a time, which is horrible. The heretic's fork was cruel, and it was a form of psychological punishment that was used to extract confessions and punish those who dare to speak out against the church. Yes, how dare thee? Now hold still. Number four, sewer surfing. Uh, it's not as cool as you're imagining, but it's something along those lines. Also known as sewer hunting and or draining, sewer surfing was a popular but illegal activity during the Dark Ages, and involved navigating through the underground sewage systems of cities, typically for thieves or other illicit activities, trying to find some gold, something, I don't know, something shady going on under the city. Sewer surfing was often punished severely, more than you'd think here. Guys going through garbage, they're like, ah, hang him. It's like, what, what? It was also considered a violation of the law and a danger to public health. You go down there, you come back up with I don't know, a plague that you found down there? You don't want that. You don't want a rat to bite you. Offenders would face fines, imprisonment, or even the gallows. However, despite the risks and penalties, many people, many people, continued to participate in this dangerous activity as it was their only means of survival or adventure, or money or goods or anything really. It led to numerous arrests and punishments throughout the medieval period. Honestly, Fair. I don't know. You never know. Somebody may have lost a nice pocket watch, or maybe you'll find rats and then get really sick. 50-50. I found a pocket watch. Also, the town is violently ill, so I'm rich. Sorry. Number three. Blasphemy. Blasphemy! You almost have to yell it every time you say it, you know? Blasphemy was considered a serious crime in medieval times. It involved speaking ill or speaking contemptuously about God, Jesus, and or the church. That's a big no-no back then. Big no-no. This was seen as a direct attack, a direct attack to God and the faith. It was considered a threat to the very fabric of society just because you said some sh Blasphemers could be punished in various ways. At this point, you probably know them. Imprisonment, flogging, and or, well, yeah, just you're dead now. In some cases, offenders were forced to wear a blasphemer's bridle, which was a metal mask with a spike that was inserted into the offender's mouth, which would, of course, prevent them from speaking more. Blasphemy laws varied across different regions and periods throughout medieval European history, but they all shared a common goal of protecting the sanity of religious beliefs and shoving metal into a human's mouth. All those things were very important to the faith good stuff. Number two, beard tax. I tried to grow a beard for like two weeks and I just, I just immediately bailed on the whole thing. I was like, hey, you'll see me guys. I'll show you. And then I came back, didn't even talk about it. In medieval times, I would have been fine. Honestly, this is a, it's a weird tax. There were periods and regions in medieval history where facial hair was regulated and or frowned upon. Imagine that, right? Guys trying to grow it out. It's a little, has a little stubble. Everyone's like, ugh. Really, Alexander the Seventh? Really? During the reign of Henry the Eighth in England, a beard tax, a beard tax, cha-ching, was imposed to, well, only men with beards over two weeks old. They were required to pay. If you were day 13, they're like, all right, we'll see you tomorrow. You better figure it out, I'll figure this whole thing out, mister. Vikings, however, what about them? In the Dark Ages, Vikings, they were all about the beards. What happened? Beards, when it came to Vikings, they were highly valued and considered a sign of masculinity and strength. Again, I'd be screwed if it was that time. I'd be good over here, but then I'm a very weak man over here. Know what I mean? No tax and then no muscle. Taylor McWaters, no tax and no muscle. 
<laughs> and finally, number one, not reporting a dead body. Yeah, we've all seen Stand By Me. This can lead to some problems, some troublesome things. This last one here is pretty obvious in theory, but the way that they handled it back then was pretty crazy. We're not doing it the same today. Thank God. Thank the church and the lords. In medieval times, roughly around 1240, the law surrounding the discovery of a dead body, ha, huh, surprise, what's this? Who is this? This varied depending on the region and the time period. But generally, if somebody discovered a, ha, huh, who is this uh, skeleton? What's this? Generally at that time, they required to report it to the courts or the lords. The lords, you know the lords, go tell the lords. Failure to do so could result in punishment, as of course, it was considered suspicious behavior. Fair, okay, fair. More often than not, the person who found the body, they would be asked to provide information about the circumstances surrounding the death, including any and all possible suspects. Yeah, so uh, take a guess. He had wood teeth, he looked old and medieval. I don't know, he was someone. In some cases, the finder may have been entitled to a reward for discovering the body, but in other cases, you yourself could be charged with the death. So 50-50, might get some money, might go to jail. If that was me, I'd be like, nope, I didn't see a thing, sir. I was just looking up at space, wondering what that big rock in the sky is. I don't know what gravity is. All women are witches, right brother? Cheers, <laughs> didn't see anything. Starting our list off at number 10, natural disasters. We'll begin with the Great Flood of 1607, cause eh, why not? This flood was a catastrophic event that affected the southwestern coast of England. Now the flood occurred during the night of January 30th, 1607. Happy New Year, I guess. Let's all run for our lives. And it was caused by a combination of heavy rain and high tides. This in turn caused floodwaters to rise up several meters and destroying villages, crops, livestock, stock and sadly claimed the lives of roughly 2,000 people. Sounds pretty tragic, but believe me, this is number 10. Yeah, it only gets worse right after this. Turn the clock back a few hundred years to the Great Storm of 1362. As its name suggests, this too was a massive storm that hit Northern Europe, of course causing widespread flooding and destruction. It was one of the most destructive natural disasters in recorded history, with an estimated 25,000 people losing their lives. Sounds bad for number 10, but honestly, the lives lost, it just gets bigger and bigger as the list goes, believe it or not. Number nine, medical care or lack thereof. In medieval England, medical care was limited and often um, ineffective. Yeah, nothing really worked that well because they didn't know what was happening, right? Instead of cavities, they thought you had worms crawling around in your teeth, good old tooth worms. Knock that out with a rusty hammer. Knowledge was limited, physicians were expensive and mostly treated wealthy patients at the time. While the peasants over here, us peasants eating bread, rotten dry bread breaking our teeth, well, we got the barber surgeons who performed basic surgeries and bloodletting. That's about it, it's all they did. You walked in, you're walking out lightheaded. You're gonna faint immediately. They were a barber slash dentist slash surgeon. What? You already know you're screwed when you see that resume. Herbal remedies and charms were commonly used because, well, that's all they had, and the church played a significant role in healing practices. Aside from that, not much left. You're, yeah, you're SOL, my friend. Hospitals were established to care for the sick, but conditions were often unsanitary and going there led to the spread of disease rather than curing anything. Medical knowledge, again, was so limited and many diseases and injuries were untreatable, leading to a high mortality rate that we're gonna talk about a bit later. Ooh, it gets worse, it gets worse. Number eight, punishments. The pillory was a device that consisted of a wooden framework with holes for the head and the hands. Offenders were placed in the pillory while they were publicly exposed and sometimes pelted with rotten food and or hard objects. Sounds pretty nasty. The whipping post is exactly what you would imagine. A wooden post to which offenders were bound to and then of course they were whipped with a whip or a rod. This punishment was often used for minor offenses, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, it gets worse. The ducking stool was a chair attached to a long pole that was used to dunk offenders in water, often in a pond or a river, dirty river, you get an ear infection in that one for sure. It was used to punish scolds and nagging wives. Yeah, bring on your nagging wives. We'll just take them for a dip, I guess. Your arms are gonna be jacked by the end of it. The brank, this was a metal mask that was placed over the head of the offender with a sharp piece of metal, and then that metal would go in your mouth and prevent you from talking. It's like a saw trap. As I was describing it, I was freaking myself out just then. This punishment was often used for gossipers. Yeah, again, these were all minor offenses, all things considered. Today, you get a slap on the wrist. Back then, you get rotten food hucked at you. What? 
Number seven, poor sanitation. Yeah, you're gonna wash your hands many a times in medieval England. Oh boy, sing happy birthday thrice. How does that sound? Sanitation during medieval England was very poor and resulted in widespread diseases and epidemics. Thought today was yucky, eh, way worse. There was a lack of understanding of hygiene and the connection between poor sanitation and illness. Waste and sewage were commonly disposed of in the streets, just hey, why not, why up? Or it was dumped in the Thames, leading to a high concentration of filth and contaminants Contamination, which I'll talk, I'll talk about that more later. That's a really bad day happens with that river. Public bathhouses were both used for bathing and toilet. So pick which side you're gonna use accordingly. Better, better be confident which side you're going into. This of course led to the increase of diseases being spread. The lack of proper waste management also attracted rats and other vermin, which again carried fleas and other diseases. So it was just a big bad circle. The Great Stink of London. This one here was a major environmental crisis. It was a crisis, a stinky crisis that occurred in the summer the hot summer of 1858. The River Thames, which flowed through the heart of the city, well, this was heavily polluted with raw sewage and industrial waste, and the stench was so bad, Parliament had to suspend its sessions. Number six, a lot of rats. Yep, watch your feet, it's medieval England, they're gonna bite ya. Imagine you're with your friends and family, you know, gathering around a table, eating bread, drinking ale, gathered around one candle, telling tales, good old medieval times, then all of a sudden you feel a tickle on your leg, what could that be? Be a shame if, I don't know, hundreds of rats began to swarm your feet out of nowhere. Yeah, welcome to the dark ages. This happened. Rats would come out of nowhere and it would suck. Then you have the plague. The plague rolled, or crawled rather, into medieval times back in 1328. And it lasted until 1350. That is a very long time to be stuck with plague rats. It was actually horrible. Don't get me wrong, our plague sucked. That was a lousy few years, no doubt about it. You know, a lot of Ozark, a lot of Netflix, a lot of time off. But I sure as hell didn't see any random swarms of black rats. Did you? Maybe, I don't know, where were you? The European population was reduced by a third and rats were the main cause of spreading. Yeah, way to go guys, you nailed it. Ratatouille, Stuart Little, all you guys planning your little rat attacks. Nasty, you're all nasty. No franchises for either of you, no more. These hairy balls of yuck pass it on to everybody. We gotta move on before I throw up. Number five, superstition. Ah uh, yes, here we go, this one's good. In the medieval era, cats were often associated with witchcraft. Cause of course, look at them, right? So evil. The church, which held great power during the medieval period, condemned cats as a symbol of paganism and the devil, of course leading to widespread persecution. However, the rapid decline of cats led to a significant increase in that rodent population. Yeah, remember those fun balls of fur that I just mentioned? That's where this all started because of evil devil cats. It was our fault the whole time. Who would have thought? The condemning of cats led to a surge in a number of rats and mice that carried diseases. King Edgar the Peaceful, so peaceful, we know him. He reigned from 959 to 975. He issued a law in the 10th century that set a value on cats and imposed fines on anyone who harmed or killed them. Now we're talking, now we're getting back into the nice peaceful, the peaceful, I mean, come on. The law was intended to encourage the breeding and keeping of cats as they were now seen as valuable for controlling the rodent population that threatened crops, food supplies, and um, us. We matter as well, I guess, humans. Number four, law and order. Misuse of weights and measures. Yes, false advertising back in New olden days. Let's talk about this. How did you sell stuff without, you know, getting caught? Medieval merchants were required to use standard weights and measures when selling goods, right? That's protocol. And those who tried to cheat by using inaccurate measures or weights could face some brutal penalties. I saw a video of some expert fisher and he's putting weights in a fish's mouth. He's trying to cheat his way through a fishing tournament. He got caught. It was on Reddit. So funny. But like back in the medieval times, he would have been screwed. Fraudulent begging as well. We've seen this on Reddit at some point. Begging was a common practice in medieval times, but those who were caught faking a disability or pretending to be in dire times, well, then they could be punished with public humiliation or even physical mutilation. They rhyme, but they're very different things, those two. Eavesdropping as well, one of my favorite things to do of all time. Love listening in on things, right? Listening in on somebody else's conversation is great, but back in the dark ages, this was considered a serious crime. And those who were caught listening, hmm, what's that? They could be fined or imprisoned. And in some cases, eavesdropping was seen as a form of treason, since it could be used to gather information that could be used against the state. So sometimes, yeah, real bad. You don't wanna hear the wrong thing or else they would, you know, gallows. You hear? Mm-mm, gallows. Number three, health plan? Yeah, question mark, cause yeah, here we go. During medieval England, the average life expectancy was around 30 to 35 years, with many people biting the bullet to poor nutrition, lack of sanitation, infectious diseases, and rats everywhere, huh? Living conditions sucked, limited medical knowledge was all you had, and 
Frequent wars and famines were always rolling around. So yeah, all that in 30 years or less. How fun. Common illnesses included respiratory infection, dysentery, and tuberculosis. Medical treatments weren't great at the time, of course. There was a, a lot of prayers, that's for sure. That's a lot of people relied on those. Dark Age medical treatments included herbal remedies, bloodletting, and surgical procedures performed all without anesthesia. So you're gonna feel every wrong move to say that. However, there was also some advancements in medicine during this time. It wasn't all bad, including the founding of hospitals and the use of quarantine to prevent further spread of disease. How fun is that? Imagine being the first person to think of a quarantine. You're like, hey you, no, go over there. How does that sound? Yeah, we're doing something right now, trust me. Number two, war. What is it good for, you know? In the Middle Ages, this was a time of frequent warfare in Europe. This was due to various factors, such as the rise of feudalism, religious conflicts and territorial disputes, all those good things. One of the most significant was the Hundred Years' War, which began in 1337 and lasted, well, as you could guess, until 1453. Yeah, it wasn't quite, it was a hundred and a bit, but you know, sounds cool if we say it like that. It was fought between England and France over control of territory in France. The war saw significant battles, such as the Battle of Agincourt and the Siege of Orleans, and it had a profound impact on both countries. Another notable medieval war, you probably heard of this one, the Crusades. Yeah, that one for sure. The Crusades were a series of religious wars fought between the Christian nations of Europe and Muslim nations of the Middle East. Now the Crusades began in 1096 and lasted until the late 13th century with varying degrees of success and failure from both sides to say the least. A lot of deaths, a lot of, a lot of warfare, a lot of horribleness, horrible ways to go. And finally, number one, plagues. The well known of these plagues back then was the Black Black Death, which, I mean, scary name, but yeah, it's pretty much nailed it. The Black Death first appeared in the mid 14th century and killed an estimated 25 million people in Europe, or at that point, one third of the population. Yersinia pestis bacterium was spread by fleas that infested rats. Again, so awful. Other medieval plagues include the Justinian Plague, which struck the Byzantine Empire in the sixth century and killed an estimated 25 million people, and the Plague of Athens, which hit, well, Athens during the Peloponnesian War in the fifth century BC. Another deadly outbreak during the medieval period was the Great Plague of Marseille in 1720, killed 100,000 people in France. While it's one thing to live life through a plague like we have done, we can be glad that it's not like these ones because they lasted much longer. And like I mentioned earlier, um, I don't f with rats. So yeah, this one seems a little more calm near the toes. That's always great, love that. All right, let's get going with how you're weird for drinking water. Because it's actually not true that water wasn't drinkable, just that people tended to get sick from drinking still water and they knew it. And they knew boiling said still water would make it drinkable the way that spring water and natural well water were. People prefer to drink cold water rather than hot and there was the paranoia that if the water cooled back down, it would become unsafe to drink again. So an alternative was to make something out of it if you don't wanna drink hot water all season long, thus beer. The end product of the boiled barley mix would endure storage for weeks or months, its taste would improve with time, and it was better than drinking steamy hot water all day. Two batches would be produced from the same mash. The first was a full strength beer, the second was lower in alcohol, and that was consumed more throughout the day while working or when you're just thirsty. So yes, while water was available, beer still was the bev of choice. People thought that you were either a nutcase or just highly devout religious if water was your go-to. One account by the Gallo-Roman historian St. Gregory mentions a boy so religious he primarily drank water. Ooh, shocking. Our next title is all about titles because the medieval middle whatever ages were all about titles more so than any other time in European history. Think about it. I mean, they literally called the system feudalism because of the constant feuding between higher titles. Kings delegated power among their trusted subordinates. So dukes are under kings and they rule duchies. Counts are under them and they rule counties. The clergy's under them and they rule religious institutions. The mayors are under them and they rule cities. And then the aldermen are under those guys and they rule the villages. These rulers and other wealthy landowners make up the nobility. Below the nobility are the typical citizens and below them are the serfs, the ones who are hard laborers indebted to nobles. Nowadays you can come from a small slum town and work your way up to Hollywood fame just using an iPhone and a ring light. Back then, if you were alderman rank or below, there is not much hope for you. You're locked into your social stature for life. A lot of us are probably feeling caught
cocky, feeling like that's survivable. You forget the entitlement you have in your day to day lives. Because living back then, everything is a debt. Ah, you may be wondering, Teresa, how is that any different from now? Society's crumbling, inflation has destroyed the young generations. Well, let me tell you how status and debt in medieval times was just as much, if not more, of a prison than nowadays digital credit system. So, now that you understand the system of titles, back to the average Joe, the peasant. Chances are you're a farmer, but you don't have any tools and you don't own the land either. The nobles have both the tools and the land. In order to actually farm, you gotta go to your local noble and he gives you the land and tools in exchange, you give him a portion of your crops. Usually this is about 50 to 75% of what you grow. So if you grow about an acre of crops, you have just enough to feed yourself and your family and pay the noble. Now if you choose this life, which you will if you want to survive, you're going to miss a couple of payments to said noble, putting you in debt to him, thus a serf. Meanwhile, your local duke wants to raise an army to conquer the neighboring duke's land. He has to get the approval of the counts under him and the counts have to get the approval of the landowners. This is because like you, the landowners don't actually own the land. Their duke does. The duke doesn't own the land either. The king does. The landowner sends some of the crops he takes from you to the duke already. But now he has another responsibility for him. He has to raise his army. Can you guess where this army comes from? That's right. It's you. Welcome to paying a debt with your life. But don't worry. Being in battle isn't all bad. Look at why they invented chivalry. In 21st century, the word chivalry evokes a kind of old-fashioned male respect for women. But in early Middle Ages, church councils were literally praying to be delivered from knights. And by the late 11th century, early 12th, it was decided they straight up needed laws to govern these guys. Knights were essentially hired thugs dressed in tin cans on horses and were commanded by warlords after all. How great do you expect them to be? They were rewarded with land or the license to plunder the villages Game of Thrones style, looting, forcing themselves on women, killing the innocent, burning it down. But a lot of the time they didn't wait for that to be rewarded. Knights were known to terrorize villages and towns they came across as if they were bandits. For example, in 1379, Sir John Ardendell rode to a covenant and asked the nuns to put him up for a few nights. After they agreed, he and his armed men looted the nunnery, stormed a nearby church, stole a newly married bride, forced themselves upon her, kidnapped the nuns, take them out to sea, and throw everybody overboard. At a time where routine night violence and with massive citizen casualties were happening, chivalry was an effort to set ground rules for knightly behavior. While these rules sometimes dictated generous treatment of the less fortunate, they were focused mainly on protecting the interests of the elite. Hope you're one of those, otherwise you might uh, die because a sociopath on a horse is bored. And now for the vast nothingness. There was nobody for miles. From childhood as far as your eyes can see outside of your house, other houses, and about 200 people, there is nothing. Just nothing. You lived and died seeing the same thing every day with only a few excuses to travel out into the world. In 1086, there were 1 million people living in all of England compared with the 53 million today. By the 1300s, this had climbed to 4 mil, but the Black Death wiped out about 1.5 mil of those people between 1348 and 1350, meaning many villages were completely decimated or just abandoned. Traveling parties in medieval Europe were not exactly rolling in options for transportation means when it came time to travel. Horses, carts, human feet. And that last one was by far the most common. There were a lot of reasons why even the average peasant may travel. In England between 600 AD and 1485, these included going to mass because early villages didn't really have their own churches or attendance at the local court, which was compulsory for all free men once a month. Payments of taxes to the royal manor four times a year. But just short of going to the neighboring big town, most never really left their homes or their home community. Women especially, they weren't seen to have much purpose outside of their front door. On a lighter note, pigs in your blanket. No, not in a, uh, in yours. Because when you live in a mud and straw hut that is 100% full of humidity and would absorb every smell ever brought into it, including that of the family beer bucket, what you want to do is add an animal pen to that and a loosely made roaring fire in the middle of the room. There were a number of home designs revolving around a single room first floor with a fence or other partial barrier dividing it. Animals were kept on one side of the barrier, humans lived on the other. This kept the animals body heat inside the house, marginally adding to the indoor temperatures during the cold season and providing literal hell during the summer ones. But I mean, hey, you could always let them wander loosely outside. But weren't medieval houses like super tiny? <laughs> Correct, but 
So we're the medieval farm animals. Homies were undernourished and so small that a full grown bull was around the size of a modern calf. And sheep were only a third of the size that they are now today. Modern sheep yield around 7.3 pounds of wool. Medieval fleece yield was something less than one pound per animal. And speaking of, let's segue into how all your food was dry. We sure, we can't truly know if medieval food was bad because nowadays we're spoiled. We have spice and garlic and proper cooking abilities. They had some meat, some grains, some vegetables and a figure the F out mentality. As a result, we're gonna be more grossed out or picky with their food, but if we experienced it from their perspective without having tasted the food we've tasted now, it probably wouldn't be half bad. But hell would it be dry. Just so dry. That's the one thing I don't think any of us could survive even with perspective. In the medieval period, meats and breads were kept well stored by drying them. Meat specifically was salted then dried. Bread at the time wasn't made with yeast, so it tended to be flatter and it didn't mold. It would just go harder with time. Let's do some comparison. Here's the meat of the medieval period compared with some modern day beef jerky, the closest thing. Even our dried meat of the 21st century is juicier than the medieval version and probably wouldn't be the usual jaw workout. Now for bread, here's some medieval bread and here's some modern day bread of similar composition. See how medieval bread is a lot more enclosed and sturdier than modern bread? Looks like if you needed a spare tire, you could drill a hole in this bad boy, toss her on the frame. Medieval food was meant to last. and some Sometimes making things like these breads and meats were the family business. You may have seen the recent 10 reasons why living in ancient Egypt was impossible video, in which case you'd know that it was a custom of the times and place for a father to determine the career of his son. This ideology was shared in a few other places, ancient China, Greece, and medieval England apparently, where the trades were usually passed from generation to generation. Commoners in the middle ages worked where they lived, consequently it made it easier for their trade to be passed down from father through son through exposure from a young age. It also meant that the father of the household suddenly died or was called to battle, a son, no matter his age, could immediately pick up on his father's role and provide for the household, and thus it remained the family business. If your dad was a cobbler, you would most likely be a cobbler. Unlike the Egyptians, whose sons would branch out and try new trades as they got older and sometimes establish their family in another commerce, the medieval English really stayed stuck in their ways, to the point that when they finally did adopt last names, they were usually that of their profession, which is why you'll see a lot of brewers, smiths, archer, fisher, potters, and so forth. But before 1066, you survived off of only one name. Which doesn't seem that bad, but it definitely was. Let's explain why. Problem one, if, if you're in a room with like three Williams, you can't just yell a last name to find the specific William you need. Problem two, let's say one of these Williams kills someone in the room and the dying man says William killed him. But there's no way for him to tell you which one it was. Now all the Williams in town get rounded up. Problem three, there's no cameras. And the eyewitnesses can verify three of the Williams in town as being in the room, but nobody can determine which one killed the man since they're all 5'4 white dudes with brown hair. How do we resolve this problem? Depends on the village, the clergy, and how much those Williams were each liked in town if anybody had a bias towards them. They may determine the right one. They may decide to hang all of them because they don't know who did it. When surnames were introduced, they'd often include a nickname, such as Richard Red if your hair was red. If Richard went bald over time, he could change it to Richard Bald. And now our last reason you couldn't survive is just by being Cornish. If you were Cornish, you weren't regarded as English. When the Truro received its crown charter in 1173, it addressed it to the barons of Cornwall and all men, both Cornish and English. Let's break into why that is in a little known history lesson. Cornish is straightforward, Celtic people native to the island of Britain. English is more complicated, derived from a Scottish pronunciation of the word Angles. The Scots, and eventually all of the Celts, had adopted this word to refer to the Angles and the Saxons who'd been invading their lands and who would soon form together to declare themselves the kings, forcing control over the Cornish people. The Cornish were made to do hard labor in mines, their language made illegal, and they were taxed to death to fund the other English colonial wars and pursuits, originally with the other Celts and then in the Americas, Africa, and India. Funding these colonial wars meant that the English stripped the land, so they clear cut every tree and ran every mine dry, killing millions of Cornish people in the process. The Cornish rose up against the English tyrants many times, and on several occasions would have overthrown London in itself if it had not been for terrible betrayals from supposed allies. Eventually, there was not enough wealth 
stuff in Cornwall to sustain the Cornish. Millennia of Roman wars and occupation followed by English wars and occupation had destroyed the land and broken the people. This is what drove the Cornish dysphoria and it's why there's now 10 times as many English in Cornwall than there are actual Cornish people. Elders there still suffer the effects of intergenerational trauma and PTSD. With scalps so oily they could star in Greece, it's no wonder lice was everywhere. You know what? I will give them a little bit more credit. It is true, after a certain point of not using shampoo, even the straightest of thin hair can regulate its oil levels. So their scalps probably weren't the worst, but maybe they were rocking some hella dandruff. Also, as I mentioned, lice. Say you're somehow living a medieval life healthily, being whatever you are in the castle. You're making a living, you're not sick, and nobody wants to tie you to a chair and dunk you underwater. Even if you've managed that, you still have lice. Bugs were everywhere, man, all kinds of them. All on you, in your room, in your food, nowhere was safe. Lice was such a way of life that people treated appointments to get deloused in pretty much the same way people treat appointments for a haircut today. Maybe an exaggeration, but you get what I mean. People in the Middle Ages and medieval times took lice to their grave, living a life of itch, 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 itch. No one likes having rats and mice in their house. Unfortunately for castle dwellers, the dark, cold living quarters within the castle afforded the perfect breeding ground and lifestyle for plenty of rodents and bugs, carrying diseases that could have meant the end for any of the castle's residents. Name something grosser than a non-ventilated stone behemoth full of unwashed bodies. So why no washy-washy of the body body? Why is that so difficult to accomplish? Jump in a river or something, right? Wrong. Leeches, disease, death. Also, hot baths are preferred. Regular and incredibly convenient bathing as we know it today did not exist in Europe until the late 19th century, so Europeans in the 13th, 14th, and 15th hundreds were not vibing with that idea. Firstly, why Water was precious, especially during sieges, and the work was so hard and manual and labor intensive that you would build up a sweat the moment you got out of the bathtub. So bathing was seen as a waste of time. I mean, wash off two weeks worth of grime and one little batch of sweat made that a waste. Your bath water is probably brown, dude. Still seems kind of worth it. But secondly, the trouble of setting up a bath just didn't seem to be worth it. No running water, so if you wanted a hot bath, you had to boil the water yourself over a fire, carry hot water buckets upstairs to the bathtub, fill the bathtub and not spill the hot water on yourself, get the temperature right, put the soap in if you had any, get in, wash before it cooled, get out, dry, put your clothes back on, and then you have to bail out the entire bathtub by hand with a bucket and find a window to toss the water out of onto some unsuspecting servant. So yeah, it was a lot of work. And what of feces? What do these highly civilized, highly sanitary individuals have to offer us for the call of nature. The modern toilet didn't exist back in the 14th century. Instead, you either had a closed stool, which was a special seat with a bucket underneath, or you used a privy, which is a seat with a hole in it. So why not call them the same thing? Whatever, medieval people. Waste going through the closed stool, which by the way is where we get the feces nickname stool, was collected in the bucket, which was then removed, emptied, washed, and replaced. Waste that passed through the seat of a privy, which was the early kind of toilet, ended up in one of two places. If the castle had a moat around it, the waste probably would have gone in there. If it didn't have a moat, or if the privy was located somewhere without access to water, bodily waste ended up in a cesspit at the very bottom of the castle. But anyways, check out what some of the privies looked like. From what I gathered reading, there really were some castles without designated rooms for these. Just could find them in random hallways in case you wanted to whip it out and take a leak right there. At Paravril Castle, you often find privies high up in the wall, high above the smell, and safe from attackers who might use the literal crap hole to get into the castle like a reverse Shawshank escape. The most famous example of this allegedly took place during the siege of Chateau Galliard in 1204. Talk about a crappy job, it's the royal bleep shoveler. You know the word, it rhymes. So, cesspit, the medieval crap dungeon thing. Though medieval people didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells caused illnesses, meaning when the stank started wafting up a little too hard, one unfortunate man would have to clean it out. Like rich people nowadays scheduling a maid, whenever this dude showed up, everyone in the castle would hightail it out so as to not have to interact. The gong farmer would shovel the poop into baskets and wheelbarrows and take it off to bury or spread on fields as fertilizer for the food they ate. Gong farming could be dangerous, 
Paris. In 1325, Richard the Raker fell into a cesspit and drowned. Say goodbye to sinus and sense of smell as the acids cook that out of you. And stay away from the infectious bacteria literally everywhere. However, gong farmers were quite well paid despite people not wanting to ever get close to them due to their smell. Rest assured though, because castle logic was that closets and toilets are one of the same. The private castle privy was always sharing the same space as the residents stowed away personal belongings and a room called garter robes. Obviously you can see this is a stepping stone to a wardrobe being a sequestered small offshoot room. Inside the garter robe was also a toilet hole next to your Sunday best. Logic dictated clothes should be kept close to the toilet to prevent insects from damaging them. The idea being that the odor would act as a deterrent for insects. Fecal odor. Okay. And what makes all of this so much better is that you never have a second alone. If you haven't caught onto the theme here yet, it is plain and simple. Castle life meant cramped quarters. It took a lot of people to keep a castle running. There were cooks, cleaners, guards, personal servants, and of course, all the royalty as well. Plus, the royals that lived in the castle extended past the nuclear family. It was their extended families as well. As a result, most of the rooms were multifunctional and the keep was the primary living space in the castle. Soldiers, servants, and even lords and ladies in waiting were expected to sleep in groups segregated by the sexes. For example, the women may have slept in bedchambers while the male servants, courtiers, and soldiers may have slept in the great hall. Even lords and ladies of castles often shared a room with a servant of the same sex. So why is that gross? Religious and royal obligation to reproduce. Also people without an obligation who would really like to do it anyway. As long as those people are married, you actually couldn't complain. In fact, it's weirder if you saw something and said something. So if everything stinks and you got next to no windows, how do you make a minty fresh castle? The simple answer is they didn't. Mold, insect, vermin, and disease were all part of everyday life in medieval times. Fresh water was precious and a reliable disinfectant was yet to be discovered. Eating a little bit of mold on your food or stepping in rooms with moldy walls were minor problems compared to actually finding enough food to eat and fighting off hungry wild animals like wolves or not dying of the plague or not being accused of witchcraft, there's bigger fish to fry. People in Norman and Tudor England lived short lives. If you reached the age of 40, you were considered old. Castles were very difficult to keep clean. There was no running water, so even simple washing tasks meant carrying lots of bucketfuls of water from a well or a stream. Few people had the luxury of being able to bathe regularly. The community back then was generally more tolerant of smell as a result. Inside the castle walls, floor coverings consisted of straw rushes and later sweet smelling herbs like lavender and mint. This could be swept away and replaced when it was of a noticeable point of filth. It was said that an ancient collection of beer, grease, fragments, bones, spittle, excrement of dogs and cats and everything that is nasty was seen when the soiled herbs were swept up and exchanged for fresh ones. But you know what doesn't help a castle? The smell of rotting corpses. Ah, luxury. There are heads of enemies cooking in the sun on spikes right outside your fresh air slit. There's the remains of a peasant shredded by mad dogs in the courtyard below, and someone is literally rotting just to your left in the wall. Castles were riddled with the dead. In the case of an oubliette, they were quite literally riddled. An oubliette is basically a little coffin cave thing dug into a wall, where a particularly hated prisoner could be tossed in, bricked up, and completely forgotten about. Fittingly, oubliette comes from the French word oublier, which means to forget. Given some of the other medieval death options, I guess starving to death bricked into a rat infested hole wasn't the worst way to go. It still was way creepier to think that on any given day a castle had people rotting in its figurative basements and walls. Must have been for great ghost stories though, not great for the smell of their decomposing body quite literally wafting up through the floorboards later. Next up is how horrible it would have been to be a lady on the rat. So ladies have periods and they need some way to handle the men's seas mess without the feminine hygiene products we have today. This this ain't the Victorian era where it was commonplace to weirdly free bleed everywhere. Medieval women preferred one of two choices. She could always catch the flow after it left her body or find a way to absorb it internally. In our modern words, medieval women could use a makeshift pad or a makeshift tampon. Pads were made of a scrap fabric or rag, thus the whole on the rag thing. Cotton was preferred because the material absorbs fluid better than the alternative wood, which not only repels liquid, but it's itchy and uncomfortable. Whether they made the choice of a home homemade pad or homemade tampon, medieval women worried about leaks and stains. This is the main reason why red was a popular medieval petticoat color. The scarlet color was not only fashion, 
fashionable and decorative, but functional to disguise leaks. Now, the period ain't what's gross, it never is. It's what wealthy castle dwelling women could afford to block said period that was gross. A common type of bog moss found throughout medieval England, Sophagon simifibulolian, was a remarkably absorbent material. Ladies stuffed their homemade pads and tampons with it, and folks even used it as toilet paper or as battlefield dressing. The popular name for this moss is blood moss. Entomologists contend that this moniker comes from its use in battlefield first aid. This account, of course, oozes heroism and masculinity. In reality, it earned the name from being used in menses and shoved up there. And definitely my favorite on the list today is protection wasn't just armor. One of the most interesting castle finds includes the protection discovered in Dudley Castle in 1885. Dating from the early 1600s, they're the earliest definitive physical evidence of the use of animal membrane jimmy hats in post-medieval Europe. The enact deposits uncovered during excavations contained both domestic and organic remains of the occupying royalists who defended the castle under siege between 1642 and 1646. The keep's latrines had been sealed during the demolition of the castle's defenses in 1647. Examining further, scientists were able to determine that five blackened jimmy hats had been used, and a further five non-blackened ones were presumably unused, all folded in on one another. The Department of Scientific Research at the British Museum boasts that their significance was magnified due to the nature of the find and the extraordinary archaeological cir circumstances in which they were found. Who might have used them is unknown. However, the complexity of the manufacture must have made them relatively expensive, so perhaps the preserve of an officer class. It's known that officers' wives were present during the royalist occupation, however, this discovery definitely testifies this was neither the time nor place to pop out a kid. Stay safe and use protection, y'all. Number 10, duels. The Dark Ages, yeah, a lot of fun. Hope you're prepared at all times to defend your home, your family, and your honor. Good luck, you get a really sh sword as well. Break a leg or two. Medieval duels were a common spectacle among men. It was a means to settle disputes and display bravery and stand like this and talk like this, of course. Dressed to the nines in armor and tights, knights clashed on horseback and on foot, wielding swords, maces, and shields. I wouldn't be able to carry any of those. My arms would be shaking just trying to hold a shield. They're so heavy. They're so impossibly heavy. These intense one-on-one -on -one bouts were governed by strict rules, often overseen by heralds or nobles. Ah, uh, yes, our noble Joe Rogan. Logan will oversee this bout. Now bump fists. Ping. Duels showcased a knight's honor with victory bringing respect to the land. Yeah, you gotta bring that respect back to your land or else you're not coming back to that land. The outcomes impacted social standing and reputation. While duels had its risks, it was an integral part of medieval culture. So go support your medieval times dudes. Go eat some chicken and watch an $80 show. They're pretty fun. I haven't been yet. Number nine, falconry. This one's pretty bad. So when you think of the dark ages and the jobs that were available, we often forget about this one. This one's pretty cool. Falconry was a popular pastime among noblemen during the medieval period and involved the training and hunting with birds of prey, such as falcons, but also hawks. But hawkonry doesn't sound as cool, so we gotta say falconry. Rolls off the tongue. Rolls off thy tongue. These noble hunters formed a deep bond with their feathered companions through meticulous training. Now falcons, prized for their speed, agility, and keen eyesight, these were used to pursue and capture smaller game. Falconry served as both a prestigious sport, but also a practical method of acquiring food because, well, Uber didn't exist back then. But you know what we had? A guy with a falcon that we can trust. A scary man with a falcon who'd walk around and, and grill you all day. Number eight. Tights. I don't know why I said it so angry. I'm like, tights. In medieval times, men wearing tights was a fashion trend that reflected social status and style. I got a pair of tights for running, and I'll be honest, I've never felt more like a knight in my entire life. Pull them up tight as a knight. Let's do this. Tights were originally worn for practical purposes, like keeping warm and having an ease of movement, of course, but tights gradually became a symbol of high fashion among the upper classes. Of course. Can we do that with sweatpants now? Can we? I feel like we're close. They accentuated the physique and showcased a man's wealth and refined taste, you can say. Sure, we'll get onto that in a little bit. Yeah, all of that in one pair of tights. How lucky were we? Tights were often brightly colored, sometimes even covered in fun patterns. They're your tights. You're living in them. Get creative. Why not? This fashion statement eventually influenced modern day styles. So next time you see a jogger, just think that's a noble knight right there. 
ready to his next bout with his water belt. Number seven, cod pieces. Since we're talking about tights, let's talk about what we stuffed inside said pants said pantaloons. In medieval history, cod pieces were a peculiar fashioned accessory, trend, whatever. They were worn by men. Now these padded or stuffed coverings were designed to protect, but also emphasize the groin area. And it got really stupid. They really got carried away with it. It became a joke almost immediately. Originally serving a practical purpose, cod pieces eventually became exaggerated and decorative, symbolizing masculinity. Again, all while wearing tights, which is so funny. What a sight to see. Some guy wearing like the biggest cup you've ever seen. You're like, this isn't cool. You don't look like a really cool guy right now. Why is yours so bumpy? You should go see the local barber and get that checked out. Uh, their size and prominence varied over time with some, of course, reaching comical proportions, covering them in diamonds, studs. Like, you know, it doesn't look, that doesn't look good, man. Hashtag not hot, get out of here. Number six, public bathing. Bathing establishments, such as a bathing house or a communal tub, these provided a place for men to gather and cleanse themselves. It was so disgusting. Now you think guys are gross now in the washroom and whatever goes on in there. Back then these gatherings were considered a social gathering where men would interact, relax, and discuss various matters. Official means, okay? Watching a guy wash his behind while he's pitching you a beard tax. You're like, okay, sure, perfect place for a meeting. Let's do it. Mind if I cover up first? Weirdo. The act of bathing back then was seen as both a physical and a spiritual purification. Ah, uh, yes, so spiritual. All this is really transcending me. I love it. Let's go home and plan some stuff. While nudity was not unusual back in these settings, modesty was still valued just a smidgen. So individuals would often use towels or cloths for some level of privacy during these meetings. Thank God. How vulnerable is that? Like, hey, any ideas? You're like, yeah, man, I'm naked. Why don't we get dressed first? Here's my idea. Number five, arming squire. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, whatever. They're saving the damsel in distress. Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister. Spoilers, you had 10 years. But that's just what being a knight is, right? It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. I mean, first of all, this process starts when you're young. When you were seven years old, you would be given to a noble to learn for seven more years. And then at age 14, quick maths. At age 14, you would become a squire. A squire is a knight's intern. Not an ideal job to have when you're a wee lad, but it's a job in the medieval times nonetheless. Can't complain. Also, you had no choice. Get going. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it, you know? Which buckle was it? Oh, okay, that one. Ugh, it's pretty wet and damp. Yeah, fixing up chainmail on a grown man's thigh. That ought to suck. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off their armor. Everything, yeah. A lot of yuck, and this was long before Dawn soap was ever a thing. So they had to clean with urine. Yeah, it gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Welcome to medieval times, moving on. Number four. Jesters. The earliest account of the fool, they go back to the 11th century. Now these fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, jumping on tables, telling jokes, farting on your aunt and uncle. It's pretty accurate. That was his job. Pretty cool. It was one of the best jobs to have, all things considered back then, this title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have. The fool's payment was also no joke. Roland Le Pateur, he was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. As long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart around. Literally, he would whistle, jump around, and actually fart. And in doing so, he had acres of land. The guy was loaded, because he was just farting on people. Imagine eating beans on Christmas Day, having a nice time with your family, and then Roland jumps on the table, starts farting on your grandma, then he leaps back over to his mansion. I hate this, I hate the dark ages. Let's move on, I'm getting angry. Tell no one. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls. Keep the business running while you're off golfing. You know, whatever you wanna do. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool, that was a bit much when it comes to assistance. See what I did there, assistance. We have some labor laws put in place now that I don't think we're gonna see an online job opening for a groom of the stool anytime soon. But hey, who knows? Fingers crossed, I'd love to see this again. That's pretty funny. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII. Now this role was to assist the king, specifically to assist his bowel movements, his activities, his big old king <sighs> sessions. You had a box that you had to carry at all times. Now that was where um, all the magic happened in said box, the dark magic that is. And you would literally follow the king around until he needed to use this box, because porta potties weren't a thing back then, and there's no way you're gonna catch a king squatting in the woods, so now we're here. Now this is your job. In fact, you wouldn't even find that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved 
for the groom of the stool. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this rule? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully, ideally? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this rule. And in doing so, they also gained access to every room, tons of clothes, and any bedchamber furnishings in a castle. And of course, high pay, thank God. Okay, maybe I would do it, that's not bad. Would you wipe an ass for a castle, Chris? Probably, right, not bad. You wipe your own for, you know, for no, for no castle, so that's fine. We can get you a castle. Number two, dentist, barber, surgeon combo. Get three appointments in one, all in 10 minutes or less. How lucky are you to be alive in the dark ages? Back then, dentists were not a thing. You weren't gently encouraged to floss more. You didn't have a fun chair that went back real slow, but they did have solutions. They had one solution, and that was to pull everything. Cavity, gone. Too thick, see you later. Maybe you accidentally bit a rock, you chipped a molar, eh, doesn't matter. We're gonna pull it all regardless. They would only pull your teeth out. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. I'm like, perfect, I need all of those today. What are the odds? They would use tools like forceps, pliers, and scraping instruments, all to address dental issues. However, and believe it or not, their practices lacked advanced techniques and understanding of modern dentistry. You don't say. Three jobs in one, yeah, I wonder how long that took to graduate. That's a Hefty program right there. So like, oh, it's 18 years. You're gonna love it. Yeah, no pay. It's good. And finally, number one, the beard tax. Here we go. You may have heard about the cheese tax, but have you heard about the beard tax? This is good. I would have been fine. I really tried earlier this year. Couldn't do it, but I'm bald guy forever. That's cool. I would have saved money in the dark ages. My God, I would have had like savings. Would have been a good, great time. The beard tax emerged in certain regions as a means of gathering revenue and enforcing social norms. Men were required to pay a tax based on the length of their beards and in some cases, even the width or the shape. They're like, we don't like that. Give us $5 right now. Lice infestations were a common problem due to the limited access of personal hygiene and sanitary practices. You know, men bathing together, pitching ideas, didn't help. However, the length and density of beards provided a natural barrier against lice. So it was believed that back then, the oils present in the beard's hair made it difficult for lice to crawl around and survive. Therefore, men often grew their beards as long as they could to prevent lice infestation. That's why Vikings had such big, long, gray beards. I take that back. I actually would have been screwed back then. I would have been so itchy. I'm itchy now just thinking about it. I'm getting out of here. See you.